prodigal church. Let's worship together. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, God is Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring. Fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood break the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? session and on your way in today you guys should have received a small group brochure it lays out all of our small groups and on your way out don't forget to sign up you can also sign up on our app or our website and there you'll also find all the info for the groups this is a great way for you to get more connected here at prodigal next week we continue our series fresh but part two and we're gonna keep things fresh with some fun new elements as we continue to look at the fruit of the Spirit if you would like to give to Prodigal Church, there's a few ways you can do so. You can head to our website or our app and click the giving tab, or in the foyer we have giving boxes, you can give there. Thank you so much for your generosity. To make sure you're staying up to date on everything going on here at Prodigal, 
make sure you download our app. There's so many great tools there, all of our past sermons and our virtual connect card. So if you're newer with us, we would love to connect with you and welcome you. Today is Sunday fun day in our PC Kids and Britt, what are you guys doing over there in the gym? We're having a blast. Today our theme is glow in the dark and the Sunday fun days are something we do throughout the year um, in our PC Kids church. So keep an eye out for the next one. For Super Sunday, I am pleased to welcome some of our friends from the NFL who gave us permission to mic them up at some of the games this season. Here is the completely unedited footage. So thanks for the help, guys. Prodigal's a place I've been to for seven years. Super Sunday, I'll be there for show. I get the donuts there and they're like really tart. Hey, you ain't gonna find your donut. Yeah, I get the coffee, it's kind of warm. I was thinking maybe I could read you some Bible verses. Uh, okay. Wait, wait. You always have got good burps. Uh, do I really? Yeah. You really think I do? Uh-huh. On a scale Twelve. of one to ten. Easy. Next to the church name, Pastor Eric's my favorite. Or Miss Brittany. No, it's basically not John, I'm afraid. Peace in the Middle East. It's like heaven in a pickle, heaven in a pickle, heaven in a pickle, heaven in a pickle. Watch, Honcho. Tiny morning rash. Borkzimmer Shasta. Rocket tall wingna. Silky Bidet Jorgensen. Wart Candy. Thanks so much for joining us for Super Sunday here at Prodigal Church. Oh, girls, there's something wrong with the audio. What do you... Uh, what do you um, mean? Oh wait, no, I think I fixed it. Uh, yep, just just keep okay, going. So we're good. Keep like going? Nothing okay. happened. Okay. So next week we're gonna greet you guys. We're gonna be like, hey guys, that was so much fun, and we are so glad you came to Prodigal Church. Yes, we are so glad you are here. We just love when Pastor John tells stories about his kids. They're so cute. It's so amazing. It wouldn't be a Sunday sermon without a story about one of John's kids. And I don't know if you guys know this, but these kids' names are Dex and Ivy. And you know when he starts to tell a story, it's gonna be a new it's one. It's the first time ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you guys know that the Super Bowl doesn't really count because the Kansas City Chiefs aren't in it. And it's not really a Super Bowl without the Kansas City Chiefs. In yeah, it. and the 49ers aren't in it either. So, I mean, those two teams. It's just pretend. We're so glad you joined us today. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Yay. Yay. Go team. Welcome to Super Sunday here at Prodigal Church. Uh, it's gonna be a great game no matter who wins or who you're cheering for. Now, most of you know that I am a big Kansas City Chiefs football fan, and I often get asked, why are you a Chiefs fan? Did you grow up in Kansas City? And the answer is no. I didn't. I grew up in Illinois where everybody was a Bears fan. But uh, when I was a kid, my favorite color was red. And so I loved the Chiefs because they were red. And then when I fell in love with football, I just kind of went all in and went crazy. Uh, it's a disappointing year this year. Only one team is happy at the end of the season and it's not us. But the Super Bowl is a really big deal in our culture. Um, every year here at Prodigal, we theme it out and we have some fun. And so today's also a standalone message, meaning it's not a part of a sermon series. Uh, it's kind of its own thing. And so next week, we'll pick up where we left off in our fresh sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. But this morning, I wanted to do something that I haven't done in a really long time here at Prodigal. Uh, I really want to share a bit of my own personal story and how, it, how and when it intersected with God and with God's story. In church lingo, this is my testimony. Uh, everybody has a testimony. A testimony is just testifying to what God has done in your life and is doing in your life. I met Jesus for the first time in 1995, sitting in a cold metal chair in a youth ministry. It was cold on my tushy uh, in a church gymnasium. Actually, this church in a gymnasium just behind us. Uh, there was a band there. They were singing classic songs like, Lord, I lift your name on high, and his banner. This was before PowerPoint. We had an overhead projector with transparencies that functioned as the worship slides and also the chords of which the guitar players needed to know for the song. Uh, as I was sitting there listening to a pastor with a patch of gray hair on the side of his head uh, share the good news of Jesus, I remember being caught up in the music. There was an acoustic guitar, a bass guitar, an electric guitar, vocalists, and at church, they were jamming, and my soul was connecting 
to the divine. And then the instruments stopped and it was just 200 voices of people singing their hearts out to Jesus. When we closed in prayer that Sunday morning, I gave my life to Jesus. And there was this pretty 20 something year old girl who sat next to me that Sunday morning. She worked in the youth ministry as an intern. And I think she knew right away that I was a visitor. So when we closed in prayer, I saw people holding hands. And so I held her hand, but I didn't know church etiquette. And so when I held her hands, we interlocked fingers. This prayer thing isn't so bad, right? Here's this 15 year old kid sitting next to an attractive 20 something interlocking phalanges. I was feeling the spirit. So I started following Jesus that day. And as a teenager, I got really involved in the youth ministry here at this church. And in that youth group, I met some of the greatest friends of my life. In that youth group, I experienced some of the most amazing moments with God. And it was in those teenage years where I saw that Christians could have fun, that, that they didn't have to be all super spiritual all the time. And being involved in the youth group here at this church kept me from making a ton of bad decisions as a teenager. Now, my friends and I, we made plenty of bad decisions as teenagers, but I think they were less bad than they would have been. Uh, I think back to my season here at this church, and I was, I'm so blessed. I was so blessed by the people of this great place. Um, uh, now, I mentioned that I made a lot of bad decisions as a teenager, but they were less bad. One of the things that we used to do was we used to sneak out of our homes against our parents' wishes and we would teepee houses or we would jump off the 10 meter diving board at Clovis West. Now, in our youth ministry, there was a group of girls that we called the Clovis High Girls. Uh, the Clovis High Girls were our age and I think you could probably figure out what school they went to. Now some of my friends were dating some of them and we were all kind of good friends. And th these girls decided that they wanted to teepee our houses. This was something that you did not do. You don't mess with the SBC, okay? That was our club, okay? That, that, that was who we were. That's what we were called. What did SBC stand for? I'm not gonna tell you. It was Satan Basher's Club. Okay, and you don't TP the SBC, the SBC TPs you. And so these Clovis High girls TP all of the SBC houses. And you know we're gonna come back with vengeance, with the vengeance of the Lord. But we don't know where any of them live. And so we give one of them, we knew where one of them lived, and we give her an ultimatum, okay? We offer her a deal, we say, listen, uh, we know you TP'd us, and you know that we're gonna get all of you guys back with wrath. But if you tell us where all of your friends live, then we will spare your house. We made her Judas. So she thinks about it. She calls us back the next day and she says, I'll do it. And she gives us all the addresses. So we buy over 500 rolls of toilet paper. We spent the night teepeeing every single house. One of the girl's families was out of town. So we went on top of her roof and rolled the toilet paper down. Um, and so that her whole roof was covered in toilet paper. Uh, we bought over a, a thousand plastic forks. So we jammed them into the front yard of all of these houses. It was total carnage. The next Sunday at church, we expected them to bow before the wrath of the SBC, but they didn't say a word. They just silently handed us a VHS tape. After church, we rushed to our friend TJ's house who lives just down the street from here, and we put that VHS in, and it was a video of these girls going to the, all the houses that we teepeed, and it was only uh, people that they wanted us to teepee. None of the girls lived there. They actually were scared to teepee these, this group of Clovis High guys uh, who were violent and who were mean and they wanted to teepee them but they were too scared. So they got their addresses and made us teepee them for them. And now we've got this group of Clovis High guys that are mad at the SBC. I know. They got us so good. That's what we were thinking, right? Now you don't want to know what we did when we finally did find out where they lived. And no, I'm not going to tell you this time. But that was my high school experience. That, I was living the good life in the SBC and youth ministry. Uh, hanging out, learning from people who love Jesus and who loved having a good time. And that was so formative for me. And even later on in life when I became a youth pastor, I just think uh, I took so much from this, my, my years here. And it was in that same youth ministry where I met a girl who was to become my wife, Sarah. 
She was 14, I was 15. She wore an orange shirt with Calvin Klein overalls over it. And I saw her first in the green room, um, which was where we used to meet on Wednesday nights, just over that building. My heart skipped a beat. And in the year 2000, um, after high school, I went on a six month missions trip in Southeastern Africa. And it was there where I fell in love with the Bible. I fell in love with uh, uh, reading the scriptures and, and immersing myself in the scriptures. It was there that I began to see glimpses of a gospel that was bigger than, than hellfire insurance. My faith was simple in those days. I was saved. And if you didn't believe the same things in the same way that I did, then you were not saved. I was right and everybody else was wrong. I was in and everybody else was out. And I really did love Jesus and I had this, this zealousness for him and his cause and his word. I remember getting into contentious debates and arguments with people of other faiths and even with Christians who disagreed about certain things that I believed. Remember the once saved, always saved debate? Yeah, I lost friends over that because they viewed it different than me. Being right gave me the privilege of being better than other people. I would have never said it that way back then, but it was nonetheless true. This, this being right, it kept people who were wrong at a distance. It kept them at arm's length. I'm close enough so that I can tell them about Jesus, but I'm far enough away from them to never actually hear their heart and listen to them. Close enough to tell them that I love them, but far enough away where I didn't actually have to do the hard work of loving them. And being right, man, it has its perks. Okay, I went to a Christian college. I majored in Christian ministry, biblical studies. I worked at three of the, the largest and best churches in our town. And I wanna reiterate, my heart was 100% in the right place. I did love Jesus. I was doing my best to follow him, but it was impossible for me to see that my zealousness for Christ was actually hindering what, what God wanted to do in me and through me. I had this way of viewing the world that was right in so many ways. And at the same time, it was wrong in so many ways. I, I'd surrounded myself with people and books that continued to reinforce how right I was and how wrong they were. How good I was and how bad they were. How safe the church was and how dangerous the world was. I was trapped in a world of Christian religiosity that constantly reinforced how right I was and how wrong they were. And living in that space was pushing me farther and farther from the very people I was called to learn from and the very people I was called to love. I had all the answers. There was no need to listen. There was no need to grow. There was no need to change. I was trapped and there was no way out. The ancient Roman poet Juvenal wrote a popular collection of poems in the early second century. And he once wrote in Satire 6, The Ways of Women, do you say no worthy wife is to be found among these crowds? Well, let her be handsome, charming, rich and fertile. Let her have the ancient ancestors ranged about her halls. Let her be more chaste than the disheveled Sabine maidens who stopped the war. A prodigy as rare upon the earth as a black swan. Yet who could endure a wife that possessed all perfections? Now, in case you didn't understand it because it's bridged by 1900 years of, of human history, let me summarize. He's saying that a woman who is pretty, charming, rich, and a virgin who's gonna also bear him a lots of children, that's impossible, absolutely impossible. And even if she existed, she would be absolutely insufferable to be around, okay? It's satire, he's supposed to be funny. But here in this poem, we have the earliest written version of the popular saying, a prodigy as rare upon the earth as a black swan. This phrase, or a shortened version of it, became very popular throughout the Middle Ages in medieval Europe. And it referred to something that was impossible, okay? A, a, a black swan meant that it was something that was impossible. It's similar to when we say the words, oh, when pigs fly, or when hell freezes over. It's an idiom to explain something being impossible. In other words, it ain't gonna happen. 
And why did this phrase represent an impossibility? Well, because it was common knowledge that back then, all swans were white. After all, every historical record indicated that swans were white, and to, to the, all the observable swans that were in Europe, they were all white. And then, on a fateful day in 1697, Willem de Vlaming, a Dutch explorer touring Western Australia, the impossible became possible. He and his crew observed black swans for the very first time, and in 1726, two of the birds were captured and brought to Europe for, for proof. For 1400 years, everybody knew that black swans were impossible. They were only white. It was scientifically documented and so deeply cemented into our popular culture that it became a phrase to refer to something being impossible. In one moment, the world as they knew it changed from a world in which black swans were impossible to a world in which black swans were not just possible, but right in front of them. Here's what I'm trying to say. No matter how much we expand our experience in the world, we will never know everything. There will always be more black swans. God will always be bigger than the lenses we see the world through. God will always be bigger than our world views. I don't think there was a moment of clarity. I don't think I had one black swan moment, but rather moments of grace that interrupted the religious life I was living. Things that didn't line up with the reality I was living in. Seeing truths in the Bible that I never saw before. It was in this season of life where I had never been more in love with Jesus. Never been more in love with studying his word. Never been more connected to his spirit. And yet, so much of what Jesus was doing in me in that time bumped against the faith I had always known. That I grew up in. There was not one singular moment that moved me toward acknowledging the lenses I was wearing as I looked at the Bible and as I looked at people at the world, were perhaps shadier than I had thought. It was in this season where I read an Irish fable about a small town filled with believers who always sought God and the obedience to the voice of God. And when faced with difficult situations, the leaders of the community would often be found in deep prayer, searching the scriptures for guidance and wisdom. Late one evening in the middle of winter, a young man from the neighboring city arrived at the gates of the town's little church seeking refuge. The caretaker immediately let him in and saw that he was cold and hungry and gave him a warm meal and warm clothes. After he had eaten, the young man explained how he fled the city because the authorities labeled him as a political dissident. It turned out that the man had been critical of both the government and the church um, during his work as a journalist. And the caretaker brought the young man back to his home and allowed him to stay until a plan had been worked out about what to do next. When the priest was informed what had happened, he called the leaders of the town to work out what ought to be done. And after two days of discussion, it was agreed that the man should be handed over to the authorities in order to face up to the crimes that he committed. But the caretaker protested saying, this man committed no crimes. He merely criticized what he believes are injustices propagated by the authorities in the name of God. And they said, well, what you say might be true, but his presence puts the whole town in danger. What if the authorities work out that he's here and learn that we protected him? But the caretaker refused to hand him over, saying, he's my guest, and while he's under my roof, I will assure that no harm comes to him. Because if something happens to him, I will guarantee that the same fate will happen to me. And the caretaker was well loved by the people. The priest had no intention of letting something bad happen to him. And so the leaders went away again. This time they searched the scriptures for answers. They knew that the man, the caretaker was the man of deep faith. And after a whole night of pouring over the scriptures, the leaders came back to the caretaker saying, we have read the sacred book all through the night seeking guidance. And we have found that it tells us that we must respect our authorities of this land and witness to the truth of faith through submission to them. But the caretaker also knew the good book. And in, and in the Bible, it asked us to care for those who suffer and who are persecuted. There and then the leaders began to pray fervently. They beseeched God. They said, God, we don't want that still small voice. God, we don't want something to be illuminated in the scriptures. We want you to speak to us the way you did Abraham, the way you did Elijah, the way you did Moses. They begged God that he would communicate to them directly and also to the caretaker so that this issue might be resolved. And sure enough, the sky began to darken and God descended from heaven 
saying in a loud, bold voice, the priest and the elders speak the truth, my friend. In order to protect this town, this man must be handed over to the authorities. But the caretaker, a man of deep faith, connected to God's spirit, looked up to heaven and replied, if you want me to remain faithful to you, my God, then I can do nothing but refuse your advice. For I do not need the scriptures or your words to tell me what I ought to do. You have already demanded that I look after and care for this man. You have written that I must protect him at all costs. Your words of love have been spelled out by the lines on this man's face. Your text is found in the texture of his flesh. And so, my God, I defy you precisely to remain faithful to you. And with this, God withdrew with a smile, knowing that the matter had been settled. Over these past 15 years, there have been moments of seeing the words of Scripture, the words of Jesus on the faces of people who are made in the image of God. And this new thing that God was doing in me, this supernatural draw of the Spirit, wasn't something that happened overnight. It was something that happened over a period of years. I've come to believe what Billy Graham once said, it's God's job to judge, it's the Spirit's job to convict, and it's our job to love. And as I continue to follow Jesus, I began to see his image in everyone, not just in people who believed and acted and thought just like me. I became convinced that they are deeply loved by Jesus with a love that is so much more than I can imagine or comprehend. And as I followed Jesus, he taught me that being loving is better than being right. I was so certain back then. And now I'm certain that I'm not certain. But I've never encountered more love, more compassion, more of Jesus' presence in my life, more adventure than I have now. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What's the Bible say, Jesus? What do I, what do I need? What, what do I got to do? Jesus responds to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, they didn't ask for the second. But loving your neighbor is so inextricably linked to loving God that they can't be separated. For so many years, I was convinced that my faith was a wall that needed to be defended at all costs. That it was my calling to convince people that I'm right and they're wrong. But following Jesus is not defending a wall. Following Jesus is much more like a trampoline. This is a video of me and my son several years ago on the trampoline. And the joy and the adventure and the not knowing what's gonna happen next. Man, we still love playing on the trampoline. Whenever someone would come over to our house when Dex and I were jumping on the trampoline, he always asked them to join. Now, I would say, son, now there's a weight limit, okay? You can't have a bunch of adults on there at the same time. But Dex didn't care. He wanted you to join him. You don't defend a trampoline. You don't argue about it. You invite others to experience what you yourself are, are experiencing. I'm not encouraging you to invite people in your life to believe the same things that you believe. Okay, I'm not convinced that's transformative. Uh, I'm inviting you to do what my eight-year-old son did. I'm inviting you to invite others to experience what you're experiencing. The joy of following Jesus. The adventure in following Jesus. The love in following Jesus. And it's an invitation to journey. It's an invitation to laughter. It's an invitation to life. And maybe it's an invitation to our church, Prodigal Church. We're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit next week, and it's going to be incredible. So maybe invite someone to experience. And you know what? Next week, when, when, when someone comes with you to church and they walk into our church for the very first time, they won't find metal chairs that are cold on their behinds. Uh, they won't find a uh, projector with transparencies shined on the wall. And they probably won't interlock phalanges 
with their neighbor when we close in prayer, but they will discover that his banner over us is still love. They will discover that Jesus still loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. May your soul be caught up in our church the way my soul was caught up in Jesus at this church 27 years ago. God, we thank you for this journey of faith and that it is about following Jesus, not staying the same. So as we follow you, open up our eyes and open up our hearts. God, I pray that our knowledge grows, but that our hearts grow even bigger. And God, may we make a great difference for your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to thank you so much for joining us online at Prodigal Church Fresno. If you are in the Fresno Clovis area and it is before 10 a.m. on Sunday the 13th, come on over where you've got churros and a ton of fun things planned for you and your family. It's PC Kids Sunday Fun Day. And so uh, we've got a glow in the dark uh, deal going on in the gym and it's gonna be absolutely incredible. We got snacks and food and all kinds of things to get you ready for the big game this afternoon. We hope you have an amazing week and we look forward to seeing you as we pick up uh, the fresh, the fruits of the spirit next week. Grace and peace.